Uh, hi, uh, I, I will be giving uh, the talk uh, for uh, Bob Spark and Uncle Micah, who unfortunately cannot come. Uh, so I will be presenting this uh, nice work uh, called uh, Noisy Tensor Completion, uh, while the sum of squares uh, hierarchy. So before I tell you about what is a uh, noisy tensor completion problem, let's first recall the uh, familiar problem of uh, matrix completion. So matrix completion are widely used uh, in recommendation systems. Uh, so in this problem, we think of M as an unknown matrix that's approximately low rank. And uh, because M is a low rank matrix, we can think of writing M as the sum of R rank one components. And uh, these low rank components usually have nice meanings for recommendation systems. For example, uh, if we think of uh, the rows of M uh, as representing users and columns of M as uh, representing movies, then in this first component, we can think of the interest here for the column vector uh, has to do with how this user uh, likes uh, drama movies. And uh, the values uh, here in the row vector will correspond to how uh, this uh, particular movie is uh, considered to be in the drama category. And uh, we can do this for many different types of movies, and uh, for example, for comedy and sports and all these kind of movies. This, will, uh, this is the reason why we believe um, the matrix between users and uh, movies uh, will have this approximate low rank structure. So a typical application in a recommendation system is the users will give some ratings about movies and we would like to recommend the next movie that the user might want to watch. Um, and that basically corresponds to the setting where we are given random observations of entries in uh, this uh, matrix M. And uh, based on these random observations, what we want to do is we want to predict what are the entries of the, uh, that are still not revealed to us. So, and if it, uh, so basically we want to answer the question, is there, is there an efficient algorithm for us to recover the slow rank matrix M? So this is a very well studied problem and uh, there are uh, many algorithms for it. Uh, probably most well known algorithm is that you can try to uh, minimize uh, what's called a nu nuclear norm for a matrix under the condition that uh, this matrix, uh, all the entries of this matrix X is close to your observations for all the observed entries. Um, so here the uh, nuclear norm constraint is used as a proxy for X being low rank. There's a very long line of work that's developing these kind of uh, 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 guarantees for these kind of uh, optimization approach. And uh, in the end, we have these kind of uh, theorems like uh, if M has rank R and uh, has some nice properties that I'm not going to go into, then this convex program P will be able to recover this low rank matrix M exactly from a small number of observations, roughly N times R. And uh, this is actually the best thing you can hope for because up to log vectors, because uh, uh, in this low rank matrix of rank R, there are about two times N times R parameters. So in order to get these uh, parameters, you need to have at least n times r observations. Uh, there are actually also many other approaches to solve the matrix com completion problem. Most of these uh, approaches are non-convex. For example, they might rely on alternating minimization. And there's again a very long line of work that tries to develop guarantees for alternating minimization. So that's for matrix completion. But um, how about, how, uh, with, uh, how about considering higher order structure? So instead of trying to predict entries in a matrix, can we try to predict entries in a higher order structure? Uh, so in terms of predictions, this means uh, the question that can we use more than two attributes that tries to make better recommendations. So uh, think about uh, a case for, say, Groupon, where you are trying to recommend uh, activities to users. Well, instead of just considering users and activities, maybe it is also beneficial to consider a third axis, which uh, in this case we think of it as time. Uh, it could be either the season or time of the day or whether it's a weekend. Um, so this uh, direction of the time will capture all these information. 
and why does it make sense for us to think about uh, using time as a additional attribute when uh, thinking about recommendation? Well, consider maybe uh, uh, something that's related to sport, uh, snow sports. Then for all these three axes uh, in the user axis, we can think of this vector as denoting whether this user likes snow sports. In the activities uh, axis, we can think of the entry as how much this activity is related to snow sports. And uh, in the time axis, we can uh, think of, of course, uh, we should have a higher weight when the time is winter, and it makes no sense to recommend uh, snow sports uh, uh, if the time is like now uh, in summer. Uh, so, so now a single component is no longer a uh, rank one matrix. Instead, is the product of the tensor product of these uh, three vectors, and that will form a uh, cube of numbers, uh, which is called a rank one tensor. We can think of there are many other activities, uh, uh, and the total number of activities will be called the rank of the tensor. So basically, uh, we can abstract the problem of recommending using two activities as a tensor problem. So we have an unknown tensor T that has a rank R decomposition. Uh, so we think of T as uh, the product of AI tensor BI tensor CI, where AIs are for users, BIs for are for activities, and CIs are for this new time axis. Um, and then we can try to answer a very similar problem as we have solved for uh, matrix completion. So basically, if the users have given reviews to these activities at specific times, uh, can we approximately fill in the missing entries? Uh, so the hope is here by adding this new attribute, we will lead to better recommendations. But uh, of course, the optimization problem is also more complex. Uh, and it might be harder to solve. So how can we think of solving this problem? A natural idea is, well, maybe we just try to simulate what we do in the matrix case, and we try to minimize the tensor nuclear norm. But unfortunately, that's not possible to do. Not only we cannot minimize the tensor nuclear norm, we can't even compute the tensor nuclear norm. And you might think maybe we can try to do some other linear algebra techniques. But it turns out that most of the linear algebra techniques for tensors are either E-opposed or computational hard, uh, as there's a very nice paper that says most tensor problems are NP-hard, and there's uh, this very long list, and um, uh, all of them are NP-hard. So, so does that mean we cannot deal with a tensor? Well, there are actually some ways that we can um, work on tensors. Uh, a most popular way is to use a flattening. So by flattening, we just mean uh, we re uh, represent this n1 by n2 by n3 tensor as a matrix that's n1 by n2 times n3. So basically, we flatten this uh, square matrix n2 by n3 as a uh, row vector here. Uh, so in our previous settings, this will correspond to we consider a matrix of users, and the other axis is activity uh, product with time. Uh, so basically, we are ignoring the relationship between the uh, activity and time. So this is basically a rearrangement of entries. Uh, and um, it's very easy to show that it doesn't uh, increase the rank. So if we uh, apply the same low rank matrix completion algorithm, it can be applied to this matrix. And we can still get some result. But unfortunately, if all of these dimensions are the same, then the matrix is actually very unbalanced. Uh, it will be an n by n square matrix. So that means we will need uh, at least n squared times r observations to fill in the missing entries, and that is really bad for us. Uh, there are many other ways to do it, but none of them get rid of this uh, n squared dependency. So a natural question here is, can we beat the flattening algorithm? Can we do something that really uses the tensor structure instead of viewing it as a matrix? Um, right, so in this paper, what they achieve is they uh, design a new algorithm that's almost optimal for tensor prediction. Again, the setting of the problem is very similar to the matrix setting, and this is the theorem they are able to prove. Uh, let's not try to read uh, the exact formula, uh, and let me try to explain what this formula is about. So in many settings, uh, we should expect the entries in this tensor are about square root r. r is the dimension. 
So if we choose m to be roughly n to the 1.5 times r, uh, think of r as a small constant, so basically we are observing n to the 3 over 2 entries. Uh, then the average error is going to be uh, much smaller than a typical entry. What that means is in this setting we can recover almost all of the entries and almost entirely correct. So basically uh, the take home message here is you need n to the 1.5 entries per rank. Uh, instead of uh, n square entries, so that's uh, an improvement over the matrix uh, algorithm. Uh, so, uh, before telling you what the algorithm is, uh, uh, let's first look at uh, some lower bounds. So, not only is tensor nuclear norm hard to compute, in fact, uh, there's a more fundamental difficulty in the tensor completion problem. It turns out that if you can do tensor prediction with M observations, it will be possible to re use that to refute a random three set with M classes. And we have no idea how to do that for M is less than N to the three over two. So this basically means uh, the previous result that we have seen is almost tight. You cannot hope to do this tensor completion problem with uh, less than N to the 1.5 entries. Uh, so the main technique in this paper is based on connection between tensor prediction problem and random CSPs. Uh, so basically, uh, in random CSPs, we are trying to distinguish between these two cases. In the first case, we have, uh, this is like a two CSP example. In the first case, uh, we are trying to approximately, uh, uh, we have this uh, matrix, which is approximately low rank. So basically, uh, th most of the entries are of this low rank form AI uh, times AJ, but uh, a smaller fraction of interest is completely noise. Uh, in case two, we have a completely random matrix that's plus minus one. So uh, to uh, strongly refute a random uh, two CSP, or actually in this case it's a two X4 problem, uh, then we will need to be able to distinguish between these two cases. Uh, and uh, the hope is in case one, the entries are somewhat predictable because the rank one part we can hope to predi predict. But in uh, the case two, of course, we cannot hope to predict uh, any entry because all the entries are independently chosen at random. So um, there are very, uh, two very different communities that work on these problems. Uh, one work on matrix completion and one work on re refuting random CSPs. And it turns out if you can do matrix prediction, then you can distinguish between case one and case two. And that will lead to an algorithm that will be able to strongly refute a random 2x4 uh, instance with M classes. Uh, so in this paper, what they observe is if you can do a tensor prediction, then it corresponds to a strongly refutation algorithm for a random 3x4 uh, instance. And here by strong refutation, we basically mean that uh, you, you have an algorithm that uh, can certify whether a formula is far from satisfiable. Uh, the reason tensor prediction is related to 3x4 is you can think of the three components of the tensor uh, as plus minus one vectors, and plus one means true and minus one means false. And the product of these three entries will then be the x4 of the three corresponding variables. Uh, that's why uh, tensor is related to these uh, three x4 classes. So on the uh, so on the hardness side, because we don't know how to strongly refute a random three x4 instance, we know tensor prediction cannot be done by uh, less than n to the 1.5 uh, observations. But on the other algorithm side, actually, uh, in previous works, uh, people have designed algorithms that can strongly refute. Uh, random 3x4 uh, instances with m equals to n to the 1.5 uh, classes up to log factors. So what uh, they are able to do is to embed this algorithm into the sixth level of the sum of squares hierarchy. And this gives a re relaxation for the tensor prediction problem. And the key tool here is Rademacher complexity, which uh, we will not have time to go into. So basically, if, uh, from this algorithm that strongly ref refutes uh, random 3x4 uh, instances, uh, they can get an algorithm using some of Scar's hierarchy for the tensor prediction problem. Uh, as a summary, uh, in this uh, paper, they give a new algorithm for uh, third-order tensor prediction that uses uh, 
roughly n to the 1.5 operations per rank, which is much better than what you can hope for when you uh, view this uh, tensor as a matrix, because that will require at least n square uh, operations per rank. Um, an inefficient algorithm, if you can really optimize tensor nuclear norm, uh, that will take ex exponential time, but that will use much fewer samples. So in fact, you can do this with uh, just nr log n observations. So it turns out there's a phase transition here. So even if you use a, a lot of rounds using the very powerful sum of squares hierarchy, which already takes exponential time, uh, you cannot hope to solve a uh, tensor prediction problem with uh, less than n to the 3 over 2 minus delta observations. Uh, so, it, so between uh, these uh, exponential time algorithms and uh, efficient algorithms, th there's uh, really a difference in how many samples you can use. So uh, going forward, this is an example for a uh, computation and statistics trade-off. So convex programs are unreasonably effective for linear inverse problems like matrix completion. But uh, in this paper, they show that linear inverse problems actually uh, could have gap between efficient and inefficient algorithms, especially when you consider tensor settings. Um, so going forward, uh, the discussion will be, uh, can we use similar techniques to uh, get uh, similar computational versus uh, statistical trade-offs? And the general idea that uh, they believe is uh, in order to explore computational and statistical trade-offs, it is often necessary to prove uh, computational lower bound, which we don't have very good idea on how to do, especially on how to distinguish between, say, a, uh, say, a square time algorithm or a cubic time algorithm. So maybe we can uh, quantify the, uh, the computation difficulty of the problems by looking at how many levels of sum of hi uh, squares hierarchy do you need to solve the problem. And uh, this will give a concrete way of uh, understanding the computational versus uh, statistical trade-offs uh, through this very powerful sum of squares hierarchy. Um, yeah, so that's the uh, end of talk. Uh, thanks. <laughs>